Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Lisa Vesterlund and Barbara Bernstein. FAN is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year, and we're honored to have the robust support of dozens of schools, nonprofits, corporations, families, and individuals from across the country. We are deeply committed to our vision of an informed and compassionate community, and will achieve that vision by presenting fresh ideas that elevate minds, expand hearts, and make the world a better place. We have hundreds of videos of past events archived on our YouTube channel, so please be sure to subscribe to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Lisa Vesterlund is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of the Department of Economics at the University of Pittsburgh and the Director of the Pittsburgh Experimental Econ Economics Laboratory and of the Behavioral Economic Design Initiative. Her highly influential research on gender differences in advancement has been featured by the New York Times, The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, The Washington Post, The Economist, Time Magazine, and Harvard Business Review. Barbara Bernstein is the Chief Human Resources Officer at Magnetar Capital, where she oversees the firm's Human Resources, Office Services, and Magnetar Capital Foundation philanthropic work. She is a member of the Management and Operations Committees and serves as the Magnetar Capital Foundation Secretary. Ms. Bernstein is responsible for supporting and advising the business on all aspects of people, culture, and organizational change. She oversees talent acquisition and retention, employee onboarding and professional development, compensation and benefits, culture building initiatives, diversity and inclusion, and community relations efforts, among others. So now let's welcome Lisa Vesterlund and Barbara Bernstein. So thank you for that introduction, Aliza. It's it's great to meet you. Um, several of my female colleagues and I recently read your book, The No Club, and we had a very interesting conversation regarding the book's takeaways and suggestions and their applicability to our personal and professional experiences. And while I think we agreed on a handful of the points you raised, we also struggled with and challenged others. Um, I look forward to discussing this with you tonight. And for full disclosure, I approached this review and, and contemplation of this book as a mother and a woman who's worked in the financial industry for decades. So many of my questions are through this lens and focus. However, I did receive a few questions from listeners who are joining us virtually for this discussion tonight. And I will anonymously ask you a few questions on their behalf. So let's dive in. To start, I would love for you to just walk through with us the arc of the book, touching on the evolution, how you came up with the concept of an MPT, the publication. Uh, so please. Uh, thank through. you, Barbara. And thank yeah. you, Lonnie, for, for having us on the, the show. We're I'm, I'm so excited to be here and to talk about our book. So uh, sort of the story arc of the book um, was that about 12 years ago, um, I, along with um, three of my friends started getting together because we felt like our careers had really gotten to a point that we were not very happy with. We were all working really, really late hours um, and we're spending nonstop time doing work that really wasn't core to our jobs. So we started getting together once a month at a, wouldn't call it a dive bar, but pretty darn close to it over cheap wine to talk about all the work that we were doing and how we had ended up uh, with so much work on our plate that we really couldn't get things under control. Um, so at every one of these meetings, we would talk about why we were so busy and why we felt like our careers really weren't uh, where we had wished for. And what we realized was that we were all spending a lot of time on work that wasn't core to our jobs. And as we started to sort of discuss it more and more initially, we called it crappy task. Um, but we, we realized that we were all spending time on work that was really important to our organizations, but weren't important to our individual careers. So we began to call it non-promotable work because while it helped out uh, our institutions, um, the, the challenge was really that it was sort of taking time away from what we had actually been hired to do. So uh, in thinking about what this non-promotable work was, we, we, we began to recognize that um, what was non-promotable really depended on your sort of your occupation and your experience. And but when you want to think about what is non-promotable work, it really is sort of, you know, it could be onboarding, helping other people with their work. It could be solving conflicts within the organization. It could be 
uh, preparing presentations but not doing them. So there's there's a lot of different types of non-promotable tasks. If you want to sort of think about um, what it precisely is, the characteristics that we sort of have identified as being non-promotable um, are assignments that don't contribute directly to the organization's mission. So if you're working for a for-profit firm doing work that isn't generating revenue would be characterized as non-promotable. So lack of sort of directly contributing to the mission is one of the characteristics. Another is lack of visibility. So if nobody can see that you're doing it, it tends to be non-promotable. And the last is whether or not it requires specialized skills. So if it's a job that everybody can do, it tends to be non-promotable. So think about taking notes at a meeting, everybody can do it. Uh, it's a non-promotable task. If you're a surgeon doing surgery, is a specialized task doing administrative work tends to be less specialized. Lots of people can do it. So those are the characteristics of these non-promotable tasks. One of the, I think, good studies that sort of really points to this is a recent study that was done by McKinsey and Lean In, where they surveyed over 400 different organizations to ask them to sort of, what is the work that we really want our leadership to be involved in uh, that we see as critical to the organization? And one of the tasks that were identified was having leadership that checked in on the well being of their employees. And by well being, uh, it included sort of saying, is the workload appropriate? Is my employees doing okay? And 90% of the organization said checking in on employee well being was critical to, to the organization. But when it came to uh, sort of assessing whether or not this was something that was recognized, only 25% of the organization said that they had any kind of formal recognition of this work. Similarly, they also asked whether or not diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts were critical. And again, the vast majority of these organizations said, yes, this is critical, but we don't recognize the work. So that's what we mean by non-promotable work. So we were finding ourselves spending lots of time on non-promotable work. And um, you know, as we were identifying this, we also had a lot of male colleagues who wanted to join our no club. And while it was hard for us to say no, the one thing we could say no to was to all these men wanting to join uh, the club. But it sort of forced us to, to put on our research hats and begin to look at whether or not this problem of doing non-promotable work was one that everybody had, or if it was something that we as women were struggling with more. And what we found in our research is that indeed this trouble of doing non-promotable work is uh, a problem that uh, is much greater for women than it is for men. Uh, we have seen it in every single occupation and industry that we've looked at. In fact, uh, we found in one organization that women were spending 200 more hours uh, per year on non-promotable work than their male colleagues. So that's a full month of work that doesn't get recognized. So the magnitude is large. And importantly, the reason why women, what we're finding in sort of a lot of studies that I'm sure we'll be talking more about is that women are not doing this work because they are really excited about doing it or because they're particularly good at it. They're doing it because we all expect them to take on this work. And this finding that it's coming from our collective expectations that women will take on the work has really important implications because both it suggests that we can't just get the women to say no, because if women start saying no, they're likely to experience backlash. Um, and also they've internalized those expectations so they feel guilty when they say no. So this problem is not just a question of getting women to say no, rather it's a question of trying to work with our organizations to fix this problem. And organizations should be eager to fix it because there are very few organizations that sort of intentionally distribute the least rewarded work to the employees who are least reluctant to take it on. The work should be assigned to the employees who are best at doing it. And it looks like by everything that we've found so far that the organizations are unintentionally making mistakes by giving a supersized serving of this non-promotable work to women. So that was what we found in our research. And part of the reason why we decided to, getting back to sort of the story arc of, of the book, the reason why we decided to write the book um, was because these differences in the work that we do every single day 
are contributing to a lot of the gender differences that we all have been concerned about for a long time. So if you're doing more non-promotable work than your colleagues, you're going to have lower salaries, you're going to get prom to promoted more slowly, you're going to be unable to negotiate your salary because somebody else has more promotable work on their plate. And second, finally, you're more likely to be dissatisfied with the job that you have. So if we can sort of improve the allocation of work, we're likely to be able to address many of the inequities that exist in the in the labor market between men and women. So that's why we wrote the book, because we really feel like this is one of the big contributors to the inequities we see in the labor market. So that was a long introduction, but it was the story arc, so. Yeah, that's great, that's great. And as you were thinking about the MPTs, I'm sure you had dozens and dozens and dozens of MPTs that you experienced between yourself and, and, and the friends that were part of the club and, and through your research. How did you narrow it down to the quote, you know, top 10 MPTs? Well, so the, um, you know, as I mentioned before, the NPTs that are going to show up um, really depend on the occupation that you're in and the experience that you have. Some of the NPTs or some of the things that are non-promotable for one individual could very well be promotable for someone uh, with less experience. The reason why we sort of narrowed in on 10 top NPTs is not to say that those are the only NPTs, rather those were NPTs that we were seeing over and over again. So, um, you know, mentoring, onboarding, uh, serving on committees, uh, organizing events, holiday parties, sort of standard office housework. Those are all things that were showing up uh, in lots of the individuals we were interviewing and a lot of the work that we were doing ourselves. So what we have in the book is this list of sort of top NPTs. Um, and it's mostly there to help guide the reader to think about am, how much and how many NPTs am I doing? How do I identify them um, when I look at the assignments that I have? And it's these were the sort of NPTs that showed up over and over and over again as we were talking to um, young employees who have just entered the the labor market. And even when we spoke to far more experienced uh, employees, they they kept showing up. Got it. Okay. And, and I appreciate your point around thinking about an MPT and, and your role in an organization and, and the size of it, because I think about an organization that of our size, which is around 200 people, some might think that's small, some might think it's big, um, where I would think in, in an organization like our size, where we are sometimes a little bit more uh, all hands on deck, and, and particularly in a role like HR, where a lot of the, the things you've mentioned are actually sometimes considered to be more key responsibilities versus considering to be an MPT. So, so I appreciate your, your disclaimer when you think. So, so, so that's a very good point, Barbara. So I really appreciate you saying that. So it should be many of the things that we list as top NPTs are for employees that don't have those jobs as their core responsibility. Uh, needless to say, if you're working in HR, onboarding is promotable. Um, so uh, mentoring is promotable. So um, the, the top NPTs are, and I'm pretty sure we have that as a disclaimer, mm -hmm. are listed as top NPTs if you're not working in HR. But admittedly, uh, I, th I think in, in many organizations, even if you're not uh, in HR, you can still be tasked with onboarding, you can still be tasked with mentoring, uh, you can still be tasked with sponsoring um, a younger employee. And the challenge in taking on that work is that it often goes unrecognized and unrewarded if you are not working in, in sort of an HR position. Got it. And, and if you're working in a maybe a smaller or an entrepreneurial organization uh, and you're taking an NPTs because there's no one else to do the work, how do you, how do, I guess, how do you wrestle with that and, and trying to justify an MPT um, and annual workload, knowing that there really is probably nobody else that you can offload that to. So I think the, um, you know, while we talk about um, trying to want to steer your career towards more promotable work, it's important to also be clear on the expectation that everybody has to do some uh, non-promotable work. If you don't do any non-promotable work, you're um, you know, I'm not going to say you're going to get fired right away, but if you don't take on any any of the non-promotable work, um, that will be a problem as well. So everybody has to do some 
NPTs, the, the challenge is when some employees are doing many more NPTs than, than their colleagues. So certainly if you're working in a small organization, uh, you will have to uh, take on more NPTs than if you're working in a larger organization where there's a lot of administrative staff. The, the problem is if the load that you end up with is very different from what your colleagues have. And what the research suggests is that if you're a female in an organization, independent of it being large or small, you're more li likely to have a larger load of non-promotable assignments than your male colleagues. Um, disturbingly, the problem is even larger if you are an employee of color where the load of NPTs end up being even greater. So while the load is large, if you're a female employee, if you're a female employee of color, uh, you are likely to get an even larger load. So it's not to say that we shouldn't do any NPTs, but um, certainly until we understand which employees are good at doing what job, we should make sure that all of our employees get an equal chance at showing their skills on the promotable work so we can distribute it optimally after that. Got it. So I think it leads me into what I'm thinking about it, and I'm, I'm now putting my HR lens on a bit, is that I think sometimes when we think about the MPTs and the imbalance of it, um, I sometimes circle back around it maybe being a management issue and is 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 the person um, perhaps who the individual is reporting to really being a good manager? Um, and so I'm just curious if you think about the imbalance of MPTs. If, if sometimes it you circle back and think about it as being more of a man, a person who's who's good at managing. Uh, no, ab absolutely. Um, so part of the reason why we're saying that this issue of handling. You know, ideally, we should all try to get to the point where we have what we call work-work balance, where you have sort of the right share of promotable and non-promotable assignments. Um, the, the challenge in getting there is that we're not the only ones who decide what kind of work we're doing. And indeed, a lot of the work that you're doing is, is work that is being handed down to you from a manager. And it can be handed down to you from a manager in a number of different ways. It can be handed down because a manager... Uh, asks you directly to take it on. What we see in our research is indeed that women are far more likely to be asked to take on. Uh, if a manager is faced with both male and female employees, a female employee is 44% more likely to be asked to take on an NPT than a male employee. So we get this excessive demand for women to take on this work. And this is you know, this is from studies that are very neutral, but part of what is driving this is this expectation that women are going to say yes. So I was chair of my own department. You have to get things done quickly. Uh, when you have to get things done quickly, you are going to ask the employee that you think is going to say yes and will do a good job. And regrettably, when it comes to non-promotable work, more often than not, the person that comes to mind when you want to think about somebody who will say yes and do a good job is going to be a female. So. Um, it is certainly a management issue, both because we are inclined to ask women more because we think they will say yes. We're also more inclined to think that they'll do a really good job and fail to sort of account for the fact that while they might do a good job on this particular assignment, maybe they could do an even better job if they were given a promotable assignment. We're also inclined to sort of think about who's appropriate to do a particular job and more often when it comes to this unrewarded work, it will seem more natural to ask a woman. So these collective expectations sort of put us in this position where we're more likely to ask women. Now, another problem is not just that we're more likely to ask women. We also oftentimes, when it comes to work that nobody wants to take on, are more likely to just say, who wants to take on this assignment than nobody wants? So we've all been in those dreadful meetings where a manager comes in and describes a client or a case or an assignment that nobody wants to take on. And we all know that uncomfortable feeling when we all sit around and, and wait for time to please go quickly. And suddenly everybody seems disengaged. Many people pretend like they can't hear anymore. You know, they're checking their watches to see if suddenly a message came in. The problem with that scenario is, and we show that in our research as well, is that when you're just asking for a volunteer, we all, men and women, expect women to take on the assignment. 
And indeed, it turns out that women are more likely to volunteer when they sit in this situation. So when we're all sitting there waiting for somebody to raise the hand, if we all expect a woman to raise her hand, it becomes in her interest to raise her hand. So indeed, our, our research shows that women are 48% more likely to raise her hand and say, sure, I will take on the assignment that I would much rather somebody else do um, and everybody else can lean back. So uh, I, I think it is a management issue and, and you can say it's poor management. Um, at the same time, I think we haven't been aware of these inherent biases we have to give this work to the female employees. I don't think we've been aware that when we ask for a volunteer, we're far more likely to end up with a, a female employee taking on the work. Uh, I don't think we've been aware that when we're in a rush to get something done that nobody wants to take on, that we're far more likely to ask a female employee. So while, um, while it's sort of indicative of poor management, I don't think it is poor management in the sense that someone isn't trying to do a good job. I think these inherent expectations and biases that we have ingrained in the way that we interact are coming into play. And the reason why we wrote the book is to try to stir up those expectations so that we can encourage management to do better at allocating this work. Okay. And for, and for the listeners out there who maybe are feeling this, um, what you're describing is getting the overwhelming number of MPTs and, and would love maybe if you have some tips or suggestions for the, for the struggling woman out there that would like to be able to say no, but maybe isn't able to find her voice in saying no. Yeah, so that, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, the challenge with talking about this being driven by expectations um, is that you have to be very careful about saying no. Because if everyone in the organization expects you to say yes, you could very well experience backlash if you say no. So there is a, a very disturbing study where they look at how uh, women and men are perceived if they're asked to help out and say yes and no. And consistent with sort of these expectations that women are more likely to uh, say yes, they, they find that when they ask a woman and she says yes to help out, she's perceived in exactly the same way as a woman who was never asked at all. So if you ask a woman and she says yes, she's seen as equivalent to someone who was never asked. By contrast, if she says no, she's perceived very negatively. So there's this backlash against a woman. If instead we look at a man and he's asked to help out, if he says no, he's perceived identical to someone who was never asked. If he says yes, he's perceived as much more positively. So it gives you an indicator of what is going to happen if a woman starts saying no. And that, that is where it becomes, um, you know, hard to figure out how to navigate all these many requests. Um, nonetheless, I, I do think that we have a lot of guidance in the book to, to talk about how to say no and talk about sort of first, how do you assess if something is promotable and non-promotable? How do you assess if you can say no? And if you can say no, to say no in sort of an effective way. Um, I think we've all tried uh, writing those you know, crazy long emails where we sort of keep excusing ourselves and explaining why we can't do anything and or do something at the end of the email. It's just like, oh, forget it. I'll just get it done. Um, but an effective no is one that really thinks about what the requester uh, wants from you. So the requester wants to solve a problem. Um, so giving a short explanation for why you can't do something. Um, so it might be that you're saying, I'm working on a really important promotable task. Say I'm working on the product launch. I can't help out with uh, the holiday party that you want me to help out with, or I can't serve on the website committee because then I can't spend all my time on the product launch. However, Jim just joined and he doesn't know anybody. So why don't we ask him to do uh, the holiday party? So solving the requester's problem along with a short explanation is sort of the, it, certainly what we found um, amongst ourselves was a very effective way of, of saying no, because you explain why you can't do it. You, you make it clear what the opportunity cost of your time is, and then you give a solution 
and, and help the requester solve the problem, which is what they were looking for. So giving sort of a, a quick excuse and a solution is a good way of saying no. Another option when you can't say no is to be sort of a little careful in how you say yes. So it's not just a choice between saying yes or no, you can negotiate that yes. So that you, you know, if you've thought sort of carefully about one of the things that we really encourage women and men to do is to look at the assignments that you have and identify what are the non-promotable assignments you have? What are the promotable assignments you have? And what are the non-promotable assignments you really want to get rid of? So sort of some of them you can offload quickly, but some of them are gonna stick around because you can't offload them. Next time you get asked to take on another non-promotable task, be ready with that list of things that you want to get rid of and say, sure, I will take on the website committee if you can take me off the holiday party committee so that you're offloading one of your NPTs when you take on another one. Another thing to do is to put time limits on how much time you're gonna spend on the new non-promotable tasks. So it could be that you say, I will do it this time, but how about if we get Ben to do it next time and Sam can do it the time after that. So that you are ready to, to step off of the non-promotable assignment. What often happens is that once you take on the work, you get stuck and you can't get off the assignment. So having a timeline for it uh, can really help. Another solution is to look at the non-promotable assignment and say, can I split the assignment into multiple parts? Is there an A, B, and C part? And can I say, why don't I handle A? Because that, that's where my expertise is, but then we can get Ben and Sam to do the two other assignments. So um, I think that those are some of the ways to sort of navigate the ask when you, when you get them um, directly. You know, there are other things you can ask when you ask the volunteers, but um, I think thinking more strategically about the assignments you have and sort of planning for, you know, there are going to be requests, be ready to respond uh, to those requests. And it's much easier to be ready to respond to those requests if you have have a vision for how you want to spend your time, but also have had a conversation with your supervisor or manager to say, I really want to contribute the most I can to this organization. This is what my load looks like right now. Is this the right balance? What, how do I strategically get onto the work that is valued most in the organization? Um, that's gonna make that sort of no feel more uh, accepted and more empowering. Okay, um, so this is a question from from um, one of the listeners from earlier in the day. Uh, so when I'm going to read it to get it right, um, which is to build on this discussion. How do you suggest that women in professions, such as elementary school teaching or caregiving, deal with MPTs when much when much of the work is value and mission aligned, but the personal professional demands are so high? So for teachers, um, there's a lot of uh, invisible work and. Um, Indeed, what the research shows is that female teachers are far more likely to be doing the invisible work, helping somebody else with their classes, helping out the students. Um, I, I think similar to what we're recommending um, in the book, it really is hard for the individual teacher to get this under control because, you know, just saying no to helping out a student or saying no to helping somebody else out is challenging if everybody's expecting you to to, to take on this work. So having a discussion within the organization to say, this is all the work that is coming my way. This is, this is how much of every single week that I'm spending on work that really doesn't get recognized. Um, can we find a way of distributing that more equally? And what you know, some organizations have done in response to our work is to come up with clear expectations for how much time you should be spending on this unrecognized work. And if you don't spend enough time on it, you simply cannot get a satisfactory performance review because the challenge, this is again, where we're sort of really pushing it out to the organizations um, as having to step up and take some responsibility for how we distribute this work is that right now there's this inherent incentive to free ride on all this work. You know, if a student needs help or if a colleague needs help, it's not helping you out. 
But as an institution, of course, the institution is going to be better off if we're all incentivized to help out. This is something that benefits everyone. So setting up some expectations for how much time you should be spending on this and keeping track of the teachers who are spending lots of time on this unrecognized work so that either it can be distributed to others or potentially if it's really important that they're doing this, this work that they potentially could get a lower teaching load, fewer classes. So thinking about how we make room um, and recognize this work, not just in terms of monetary compensation, but also in terms of alleviating the other responsibilities that end up on these employees' uh, desk. You know, where one of the places where this happens a lot in, in academia is when we have a faculty member of color. You know, we, we have this uh, tendency to uh, think that we want representation on every single committee which of course means that the faculty of color are showing up on you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, hiring committee, promotion committees. We're putting a tremendous tax on these faculty members of color because we want them to somehow over-represent relative to what they actually are representing on the faculty. And it might be time that we start sort of recognizing that uh, these are really scarce resources. Maybe we don't need representation on every committee. So limit the, you know, while it may be important on diversity, equity, and inclusion and on hiring, maybe other committees don't need representation. So thinking about the scarce resources, and if there really is a need for a greater load of service, then let's try to take out some of the other things that are cutting into this faculty member's most promotable work, which in academia is research time. So, you know, right now we're not spending, uh, any time bucketing things into promotable and non-promotable and by forcing ourselves to maybe not promotable and non-promotable, but on that continuum to just think a little bit about what should the expectations be? Should you be spending one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, a couple of hours on non-promotable? What are the expectations? Once we have that discussion, it's going to be easier to get other people to step up to the plate if they're under providing. Okay. So this leads me into my next question around, do, do you think there's an argument to be made that women actually have a responsibility to say yes to an MPT? So there's at least a female vo voice being considered when we, until we can actually have more equal representation at I'll say quote unquote the table. I, I think um, the, the response to that is similar to what I sort of just said in terms of faculty uh, of color. I think there is, uh, it is important that we have a voice at the table. Um, it's unclear that uh, that the, co so the cost of getting that voice at the table should just be carried by women. So, you know, one of the things that we've seen in, in lots of universities when we've been talking to them is sort of excitement when um, the leadership announces that, oh, you know, we have a very equal institution, we have equal representation on all of our committees. Now, if we think in terms of NPTs, imagine, which is certainly the case in many institutions, that the female faculty account for a third of the overall faculty. Well, if the women account for a third of the faculty and they're equally represented on all committees, it means that their load of service is twice as large as that of their male colleagues. Now, that's a very large load if we're trying to promote these women and make sure that they have a voice at the table um, further down the line. So I think there is a responsibility um, on women to say yes to be on critical committees. I think there is a responsibility on institutions to make sure that we don't um, use them on every committee where it's potentially less important to have a voice. You know, well, as I said before, promotion, um, you know, recruiting, all of those committees, you know, executive committee uh, assignments, representation on those are very important. Holiday party, maybe not so much. Internal review committees, maybe not so much. There's lots of non-promotable work where we don't need equal representation. So thinking again about whatever group is underrepresented, thinking about the underrepresented group as being a scarce resource, and make sure that we are using the way it's optimal. And if we are overusing it, 
then let's make sure that they don't that they end up with more access to the most promotable work instead. Okay. So um, over the weekend, I was watching a TV show where um, in the show, a female actor said to another female actor, you did an extraordinary job. And the response back was, it was luck. And the female responded back saying, only women say it's luck when they do something that is extraordinary. And I think there's a lot of truth in this statement and just connecting this to your book, do you believe that women sometimes say yes to MPTs because sometimes they don't actually feel like they deserve or belong on that committee or at the table? Um, so, so you mean that they take the NPT instead of taking a PT because they don't feel like yeah, they, they don't feel like, right. They, I think you know it's maybe a lack of confidence, um, a lack of maybe sometimes respect of the, I think it's sometimes it's a lot of just with humility around women do a, a lot of extraordinary work, and we often um, sometimes take a very humble approach when um, when I think men would sometimes actually. Um, take a, a much different, um, maybe aggressive approach in, in the compliment. I don't think women sometimes take compliments well, as I guess maybe what I'm saying. And so um, I think sometimes women in their approach to thinking about belonging sometimes will feel like they need to take on more MPTs because it's a way for them to maybe, um, you know, try to adjust or, 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 or feel like um, they don't belong, so they need to be taking on the MPT. So I yeah, just so, your thought on so that. I, I think you're absolutely right that part of, there are many components that play into why women end up uh, taking on this work. And certainly uh, differences in confidence and entitlement all play in um, to this, this issue. Um, that being said, I, I think the inherent expectation that women take on this work is driving a lot of these emotions. I, I had this conversation with a group of journalists, which I really um, found enlightening. So um, I, I spoke to this group of journalists. They had a lot of joint projects. And whenever they had joint projects, a female on this team of journalists would always, always take it upon herself to um, on the large projects to write out deliverables and dates for which when when the team sort of had to meet the different milestones. And before talking to me, the, the journalist had discussed why it was that she was the one who had taken on this work. And they all agreed that the reason why she was doing the work was because her tolerance of stress was lower than everybody else's. And, and she too said, yes, the reason why I'm doing this work, the reason why I'm taking on this NPT is because I find it very stressful whenever we get one of these projects. So that's why I'm doing it. Now, if we take a step back, the reason why she found it more stressful was because it was a lot more stressful for her because she knew that if she didn't do the job, it wasn't going to get done. And the reason why everybody else didn't find it stressful was because they knew that she was going to get it done. So a lot of the way that we coordinate around this work is that we have expectations for who is going to take on this work. And that particular individual will have internalized those expectations. So when they think about not doing it, they feel guilty because they know it's not going to get done unless they do it. And similarly, for those who are not taking it on, they know that they can take a back seat because someone else is going to take it on. So while we sort of have a lot of stories that build upon this allocation of work, a lot of it is initially driven by this expectation that we think women are going to take on the less rewarded work. And it may be because they feel less entitled. It may be that they've internalized this expectation that everybody else holds that they're going to take it on. It's just to sort of understand that these are coming from collective expectations. And that puts a tremendous pressure on women when they get asked to take on this work. Agreed. I think, uh, you know, I'd love also your perspective. In the book, um, you talk about, um, sometimes that it's okay to do B plus work. And I think for a lot of women, um, I'd say including myself, we're, we're only used to, to getting the A's. So just would love your thoughts around how do you decide when it's okay to be doing B plus work versus your, your typical A plus work? And couldn't that sometimes maybe hurt your image or reputation if maybe 
you're not you're not bringing your A game. So I, I think that's another place where it's important to have conversations with your supervisor. You know, so uh, suppose you're writing a summary of a meeting. You know, you could spend three hours writing be a beautiful summary that you know you could publish the next day. But having a conversation with your supervisor to say how much time do you expect me to spend on this because if you're spending three hours on a job that your supervisor thinks that you should spend three hours half an hour on you're not doing your job right you know and, and i mean the training happens very early i can tell you every homework assignment i get from a female student versus a male the female student it is beautifully written everything is stable it could you know it's gorgeous but all i want to know is whether or not they understood the problem. So this tendency to overperform for some things where it really, you know, it's, you could say maybe can, you know, hurt your image, but it doesn't hurt your image if you've had a conversation initially that says, no, you should be spending half an hour on taking, writing down these notes because you're not gonna deliver on all the other things you're going to be measured on if you come in with, you know, you're not showing that you understand the priority in work uh, that is being demanded of you if you spent lots of time on the work that is least important in the organization. And, and I, I think you touch on a really important point because one of the things that could easily lead employees astray when we look at performance evaluations, you know, we have these beautiful rubrics with lots of different dimensions that employees should um, perform in. Not all of them are equally important when it comes time for promotion. And if you're trying to get A pluses in every single category, you're gonna miss the mark because you're not spending enough time on the couple of categories that really matter for promotion. So having, well, it's hard to deliver B plus work uh, instead of A plus work. For some, the expectation is for some work that that is what you're going to do. So making sure that you have those expectations right so that you don't misallocate your time. Uh, I think is important. Okay, and you know, just in in the environment um, that we're in today, I, I, I've been reading a lot, and I'm sure many others on the on the on the um, Zoom have been reading about quiet quitting. Would love to to get your perspective if you think there's any connection um, between the quiet quiet quitting um, and as you think about MPTs and maybe how they're getting how MPTs are maybe managed or mismanaged. So um, there's a very interesting piece in The Guardian where they um, directly linked quiet quitting together with uh, non-promotable work. Um, and it sort of ties into, so I mentioned early on that what we found in this professional services firm uh, was that women were spending um, 200 more hours on non-promotable work uh, than their male colleagues. And it turns out that they were spending 200 more hours on non-promotable work both uh, before they become partners and after they become partners. But when we look at employees before they become partners, the 200 hours women are spending on non-promotable work, the men in, are instead spending on promotable work. So they're working sort of similar hours, it's just that they have different allocations of work. Uh, the women have work-work imbalance in the sense that they have too much non-promotable work relative to promotable. What you then see for the employees that get promoted is instead that women are still spending 200 more hours, but they're now spending the same amount, they're still spending 200 more hours on non-promotable work, but they're now spending the same time on promotable. So uh, what the Guardian article sort of was um, arguing was that the quiet quitting is really getting rid of all that excessive work uh, that you are doing that are, is not part of your job. Um, that really that shouldn't be called quiet quitting. You're just trying to scale back to doing the, the, the work that you were actually hired to do. And the problem with the way that we have set up our organizations right now is that we don't have incentives to take on all this non-promotable work. So we're going to have some employees that are doing, you know, a lion's share of the work that are, you know, getting up early in the morning, working late nights, that are spending many more hours putting in effort on work that doesn't get them any recognition and scaling back on that, or better yet, encouraging the organization to say, if we have all this work, which they all do, that is important to us and that we're not recognizing, then we either need to find a better way of allocating it so that everybody gets 
similar access or opportunities to demonstrate their skill, or we need to reassess whether it really should be promotable work or the ways that we could reward it that would give everybody an incentive to do it. So I think there is, um, I think there is a close link between quiet quitting and non-promotable work. And you know, if we look at most organizations during the last recession, what did we all do? We got rid of administrative staff. That work went somewhere. And um, going into the pandemic, there is far more administrative work uh, that had to be allocated. And if women are doing the lion's share of this work, it's not surprising that at some point they're saying, I, I'm, I'm going to start focusing on the work that I was really hired to do. I'm, I'm not going to do all this other work that I have no contractual obligation to do because it looks like everybody else is managing not to do that work. So one of the reasons why this is not just a question of saying it's unfair to women um, is that there's a really strong business case for why it is that organizations should step up. First, it's not in their interest to have all these employees shirk on work that they really need to get done. But secondly, they're not identifying the true talent that they want to retain and promote. So focusing on what it is that organizations are losing, hopefully can push them to change the incentive structure and change the way that they are sort of accounting for unrewarded work so that it implicitly becomes rewarded because if you don't do it, you don't get a satisfactory performance review. So. Um, that was a long way around the, the quiet quitting, but um, it really is because we have all this work that doesn't get recognized and we need to find ways of recognizing it in order to have people do it. Okay, great. So another question that came through earlier today, I just want to make read this again to make sure I, I, I get this right. Um, for women that have invisible disabilities, such as um, ADHD and sleep disorders, anxiety, are there any tips you can share to help women navigate the added challenges when managing promotable versus non-promotable work? It, so I don't know if the advice um, is, is different from what it is for, for everyone else. Um, you know, I, I think having a conversation with a supervisor about sort of the shared goals of getting you to contribute the most to the organization um, is an important step to getting the right balance in this work. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, what we're seeing time and again is that the, the, like the organization with the 200 hours, they changed what they were doing. They did not intend for their female employees to spend so much more work on non-promotable uh, assignments. So making it clear to a supervisor that this is how much time I'm spending on non-promotable work, or first asking, what do you see as the most promotable work that I'm doing? What do you see as most critical when it comes time for promotion? This is what my current allocation is. Is that, is that about right? Is that where it should be? Or is there some way that I can contribute even more to the, the organization by spending more time on the work that directly contributes to your mission so that it doesn't become about this isn't fair to me, or this is why it's hard for me, but instead about how can I help the organization more? And in doing that, how can we get me to a point where I can get promoted? Okay, and, and as, as I think about this, um, I mean, it's hard not to be watch the news and, and seeing what's going on in the world and the economy. And I think recognize that we're gonna be going probably more into a tough economy um, how do you suggest maybe navigating MPTs in, in a tough economy where I think candidly um, there can be more of a fearful of losing your job and I think women sometimes could just actually want to raise their hand to decide to take on more MPTs because they're much more concerned about losing their job. Um, so would love maybe your insight on, on how to think through that, particularly as I think we, you know, what we may be faced in over the next six to months to a year. Yeah, um, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, th and that's where, um, you know, we are very cautious in saying that we should start saying no to lots of things because um, especially in a top economy, being seen as a naysayer is, is not um, very, uh, very good. Um, and that's where having these conversations and having allies in how we get these, distributions of work, you know, next time you get asked to take on an NPT in a meeting, it might help 
if you have a mentor or an, or an ally that says, you know, Barbara uh, did this assignment last year, how about if we uh, give it to someone else so that they can have the experience and Barbara can work on the product launch instead. So, um, you know, having allies that can help allocate the work or having an ally that says, you know, why don't I do it this time? And then we have Jim and Ben do it next time so that you make it clear that a rotation is advantageous. So um, the direct no is, is hard, but there are many small steps that you can take around that. If you know that women are going to be the ones who volunteer more when you ask for a volunteer, just suggest putting names into a hat. You know, so I think there are, there are many small steps that may not get at sort of the overall problem of NPTs, but they're still going to help. And once you start raising this issue of NPTs, hopefully management will see that it isn't in their interest to follow the path that they've been following in the path in the past, so that they start stepping up and saying, you know, let's let's pay attention to this. You know, what they now do at the University of Pittsburgh is that every new chair is given one of our manuscripts so that they can see this is not what we want to do. These are all the biases that you're going to have for distributing work. This is not what we want to happen. So think about it before you step in. So I think there, there are many small steps that can be taken that may not sort of attack the entire problem at the same time, but will go part of the way that will uh, hopefully get around, um, will make it easier not for women to say no, but to steer their careers towards more promotable assignments. And I'm wondering are you, if it's something where we could translate the MPTs to perhaps outside of the workplace. So thinking about it at home with your family, your friends, um, nonprofit organizations that, that individuals are involved in. Do you have any suggestions? So, um, you, you know, I, I think the challenge is when we get into the workplace is that we take a lot of the norms and expectations that we have it in the household. Um, many of the norms and expectations come from women carrying babies and men not carrying babies. Um, I, I think the big step when we get to the workplace is that there are absolutely no reason why that should matter once we get into the workplace. So uh, the first step is to, to stop that channel. Now, how we sort of get work-life balance and make sure that we share the, the efforts at home is, is a whole different issues that are, is, I think in contrast to the workplace is uh, potentially more tied to um, preferences and more tied to sort of what we call comparative advantages. You know, my husband likes mowing the, the lawn and he's really good at it. That's one of the reasons why he's doing that. That shouldn't matter once we get into the workplace. So it's, it's not to say that we should all be doing the same things. It is just to say that when it gets to the workplace, there's no reason why the expectations that we have in the household um, should be carried into the workplace. And we really need to stop and, re and reflect on that so that we use the employees that we have. What is so disturbing is that we have all these young women getting advanced degrees, often getting much better grades and coming in more experienced than their male colleagues. And very quickly after they enter the labor force, they're sidetracked down a path where they don't get to spend time on the work that they really train to do. And we're doing a disservice to them and a disservice to the organization if we don't find ways of making sure that at least when they start out, they have the same opportunities to demonstrate their skills. Great conversation, Barbara. Thank you so much for really just uh, helping everybody walk through Lisa's Lee's, work. It's really, uh, it's I know it's applicable to so many women, particularly, of course, uh, who are listening in. They're probably having um, points of recognition, like, oh, it sounds like me or sounds like me at my last job. Or, um, you know, I, I will also admit as someone who is leading a team of doing some searching of myself and in terms of uh, wanting to be more aware of when I'm, um, you know, executing those same kind of biases, you know, and and to be to monitor myself as well. Uh, although we have an all female group, it's it's kind of interesting that way to me. Um, we had two questions that came in in particular that are aligned, and they kind of also echo another question that had been submitted ahead of time. And I think so, uh, they're basically looking, Lisa. They're looking for maybe 
if you have some observations about some systemic solutions. Um, you've offered a lot of great solutions for the individual uh, staff person, worker in the, in the work environment. Um, so uh, Eve is saying, do you have suggestions for organizations on how to strategically embed fairness around delegating NPTs for women and other people in other marginalized groups? And then Rebecca chimes in and says, yes, I have the same question. How do we put the challenge on the systemic broken culture, not on each individual woman? Oh, so that's that's a that's a great question. I, I I really appreciate you raising that, Lonnie, because it's it's one of the things we make clear in the book is that this is not a question of fixing the women. This is a question of fixing the organizations. This is really the 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 this is in the interest of the organizations, and they're the only ones who can really fix the problem. Um, and some of the things that we talk about for organizations, step one is just to raise awareness, just to to talk about what are the what is the work that is promotable, what is the work that is is less promotable, maybe not non-promotable, but less so. So just raising awareness of this, spending some time just thinking sort of at a very high level, who is doing what? One of the things that one of the co-authors of the book, Lori Weingard, did when she was dean was just to say, let's just count who's on what committees, who, you know, how many women are on three or more committees, how many men are on three or more committees. So just paying attention to who's doing what to sort of get a sense, is this a problem in our organization? And then think carefully about how is it that we allocate this work? Are there different ways that we can distribute the work? Are there simple mechanisms like taking turns or randomly assigning work? And then importantly, you know, really figuring out, should this be non-promotable? It's crazy that some, you know, that people are involved in onboarding and it isn't promotable in some organizations. Onboarding is one of the most critical things we do. Of course, it should be promotable. And while it's promotable for HR personnel, it is not for everybody else. So sort of assessing what is promotable and non-promotable and hopefully also decide whether or not there's some work that we really shouldn't be doing in the first place. So the, you know, it's up to the organizations to assess this. And hopefully in that process, they will find that some work really shouldn't be done at all, or some work really should be done by someone who is less experienced and is paid a lot less than the employees who are currently doing it. Okay, I want to remind everybody that we're going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have an after hours available to come and hang out with Barbara and Lisa and ask your own questions um, tell about you know, talk about your own experiences, get some advice. Lisa has tons of great advice, and so does Barbara. I might add, um, she is not new to this game and has uh, got some uh, a great wealth of experience to offer to people if they'd like to come to After Hours. We've been putting in links in chat. We just put in another one now. The way to come to After Hours: buy a copy of the No Club. You'll get in your receipt from the bookstall. You'll get a link to register for After Hours. It's going to start at about eight oh five which is six minutes from now. Um, and I actually, I'm thinking about, um, I want to ask in particular at After Hours, I want to know, um, Lisa, I want to know if you're a parent um, of either male, female parent or in between, uh, what would you tell those folks to to say to their daughters uh, from beginning when they're six years old and 16 years old and 26 year old, what's some of the guidance, like what do you model at home would be kind of interesting. Um, but everybody, so thank you so much for coming. Lise, do you wanna give us any parting thoughts as we close out the Zoom? I, I think my parting thought is really that we've been looking at gender difference for so long. We've been focused predominantly on the differences. So differences in wages, differences in promotion, differences in negotiation, differences in burnout. It's time that we start looking not just on the outcomes, but start looking at how we spend every single day in the office. And once we look at that, we'll see that these differences in work assignments is contributing to every single one of these factors that we've been observing. So unless we start equalizing how we spend every day in the office, we're never going to be able to get gender equity, get women to advance at the same rate. We're never going to get them to negotiate because you can't negotiate if you're doing lots of non-promotable work. So if we want to address these issues, we really need to start looking at how we spend every day, which is why we wrote the book and <laughs> getting awareness is the first step. So we're so excited to have had this opportunity to talk about the work, Lonnie. So thank you for having yeah, me on. Thank you so much. We have to say thank you to David Figlio too, who uh, first connected us way back when on Facebook. So thank you, Barbara, again, and we'll see you in just about five minutes. Thanks everybody. And uh, thanks for engaging with our programming. Have, everybody have a good night. Thank you.